Ah, the smooth sounds of Chris Smith counting us down to another episode of the Musky Monday Seminar Series. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. My name is John Anderson, and I'm going to be your host for another episode. I said episode three, season one. I don't know. We'll see how far we go. But uh, right now, we're planning on doing this every week for the next 20 weeks. Um, so I, uh, I hope you like what you see. Give us your feedback. Um, today's show is called Cutting the Learning Curve, or a look at the elements of essential learning in musky fishing. Um, we all have one question in musky fishing. It's how to catch more muskies. And if you look at the knowledge base that it takes to do that, um, there's essential knowledge and skills that you need to learn. And there's uh, uh, better and best ways to learn these things. And so we're going to look at some of the things you need to know and um, and how you can learn or how you can best learn um, some of the skill set that makes you a complete angler and helps you catch more muskies. Uh, today, I'll give you an outline on today's show. We have three parts to today's show. Um, I'm going to ramble at you for the first part of the show um, and talk to you about about learning. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, musky behavior. That's uh, sort of ground zero for uh, for going musky fishing in my world. And a lot of people know how to musky fish. They don't necessarily tie what they're doing to the behavior. So we're going to talk about behavior. And then we have two very special guests for this evening. Uh, we have Frank Ungaro from the Ugly Pike podcast series. Um, and uh, we have Dave Belisle, who's the chapter chairman of the Hamilton chapter of Muskies Canada in southern Ontario, uh, a really vibrant chapter. And both of them have you know, different angles on learning, and different knowledge to contribute. So um, I can't wait to talk to Frank. He's, he's an obsessive learner. I'm going to tell you more about that as we go. Um, Lisa is in the background. And... Lisa, do you have some some photos um, that you can throw up right now? Frank is our special guest tonight. I'm going to give him a better introduction later, but um, we have some um, some great adventures together. And Frank always, uh, Frank and Alex Bhutan and I always end up with some amazing pictures when we go fishing. And uh, a lot of you know, there's a lot of grip and grin photos in the musky world, and. You know, after you've been at it for a while, you work hard for special photos. Spencer Berman once said to me when he was um, a kid, he looked me in the eye and said, you're only as good as your photos, John. And, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of truth in that. So the photo that's up there right now, that was the last muskie I reeled in this year. And Frank took that really neat picture right there. Um, that was out on the St. Lawrence in December. Do you want to hit another photo, Lisa? Um, again, just a really different camera angle, something something special. Um, just like what Frank does with the camera, hit it again. Okay, again, pictures that just come to life and capture capture that moment in time. And finally, you know, really good advice when you're shooting pictures, um, don't shoot the standard grip and grin shot. If you want to go to that fourth photo, Lisa, um, you know, shoot the day. Tim Allard, uh, one of my favorite writers from Ontario out of doors a bunch of years ago, gave us a, a lecture at Muskies Canada on shooting pictures. And the first thing he says is don't shoot the fish, shoot the day. And so this is a, it's an incredible photo that we got out on an outing in October a couple of years ago. So look forward to telling you more about Frank in a few moments. And, uh, and Dave, he'll get an appropriate introduction as well. Um, I always start off by saying thank you. I'm going to get faster and faster at my thank yous as you guys learn more of this routine. But um, thank you, the listener, the viewer. Um, first of all, the response has been really overwhelming uh, for our first couple of episodes. Um, hundreds of comments, thousands of views. Um, we answer every question that you guys submit to us. And the ideas for our show will evolve from what you ask, from where you want to go, uh, and from your suggestions. And so please, um, all through this show, um, if you're just watching this later, anytime you see one of our episodes, 
on YouTube, on Facebook, wherever it is, send a question. I promise that we'll get back to you. Um, I did want to answer one of the comments from last week. Uh, quote was, your unkept gray hair makes you look old and tired and is a disservice to not only you, but your viewers signed embarrassed, your mother. And um, wow, that, you know, I don't have a lot to work with these days, mom. Um, I'm, I'm trying and I actually put a, a comb in my hair for the first time in a, a, about eight or 10 years today. So I hope you like it a little bit better. And every week we get a little bit better on this show. And a, a good reason for that is um, because of the help that we have putting this together behind the scenes. Uh, and the great guests that we have. So I'd like to introduce you to uh, Lisa Goodyear and uh, Mike Kadura, two of the guides from the Ottawa River Musky Factory. Lisa's back behind the scenes and she runs all the tech stuff. because I have no idea what's going on and she makes it looks like the good production it does. Both of those two are going to answer questions as we go uh, through the show. Um, I can't walk and chew gum at the same time and so they take care of the chewing gum part and uh we'll get this done thanks a lot guys and then mike spratt from musky factory baits um super friend super worker super bait maker thanks a lot uh shimano celebrating 100 years um so proud to be on the shimano team um for a long time andre lalone and crestliner boats andre is the best boat guy i have ever had out of Wendover, Ontario. Going to have him on the show later in the year, hopefully to talk a little bit about looking after your boat. <clears throat> and I always say thank you to Muskies Canada. Um, there are, wait, before that, I'm going to say thank you to uh, Suic. Um, we are uh, the newest Suic dealer in Canada. Muskie Factory Baits plans to be the home of the Franken Suic. So hard to get bait. We're going to work to have that in stock all musky season long, especially in the fall when we love them. And Muskies Canada, so many reasons to support Muskies Canada. Um, you know, if you've heard me talk or you've been on this show before, um, one of my favorite things about Muskies Canada is the badge. It says sport fishing and research going back to Muskies Canada inception 50 years ago. Um, Muskies Canada research, I'm going to talk about a bunch of that today. I have been able to uh, uh, learn a great deal um, by participating in Muskies Canada research for, for 25 years. And I'm going to share some of that, uh, some of that learning with you today. Um, a lot of that behavior knowledge comes specifically from research. Nobody drives more musky research in Canada, maybe in North America, than Muskies Canada. Um, we think so much of what they, they do that we give $2 from every bait that we sell from musky factory baits directly through research um, done in conjunction with muskies canada with stephen cook labs at carleton university um, and with some of the individual chapters who contribute and uh, we look forward to doing a lot of good things in the next bunch of years and i have a a rumor um a, a strong rumor coming out of the the muskies canada circle there's a bunch of people uh working really hard behind the scenes. There's nothing official to announce yet, but um, check uh, check on the Muskies Canada website. You can check with me. Um, there should be some news on an Odyssey, an Odyssey 2021. Um, if you don't know what an Odyssey is, an Odyssey is the single greatest uh, learning event that takes place in the Muskie world in Canada. Um, the greatest single event of all time was the last Muskie Odyssey we were able to host in 2019. Uh, we had, I don't know, 13 or 1400 people come out to it. Uh, just a host of speakers, um, specialty sections, fly fishing section, women's section, um, um, Jimmy Sarix there, uh, who's who of bait makers. And so what an opportunity to learn. Um, pay close attention to that. And Muskies Canada should have. Uh, a little more to say on that shortly. Wow, um, big news for us there. I want to talk to you about the Musky Monday seminar schedule coming up in the next couple of weeks. January 25th, next week, J.P. DeRose. J.P. currently produces the Renegade uh, Bass Fishing uh, Series. He's produced a, a handful of other shows that you've watched. Um, 
watched and loved. He's a high end producer. He is the smart, one of the smartest guys I know in the fishing industry. Um, he doesn't know tech specs. Uh, he knows the physics behind why everything works and how it's put together. JP's joining us next week. Um, we're going to talk the tools that we use. Uh, if you're thinking of buying anything this year, JP has all the answers on the specs. And we're also going to talk technology. Um, big, big part of learning today. I'm going to touch on technology this week, but um, kind of the new frontier of learning in the musky world. Technology is changing so fast um, and the tools are just essential. You need to stay up with those changes from um, from year to year. The week out, uh, second guest for next week, we're bringing in Marlon Prince, um, the Prince of Muskies, as I hear he's called. Marlon's a legend in the uh, maritime musky fishery. And if that sounds weird to you people who haven't been keeping up, um, the latest, uh, the newest musky fishery in Canada um, is, is the St. John's River in New Brunswick. And why do you need to know about that? It's a new age fish, fishery. It's got an, in, a, an incredible creation story as to how it, it came to be. It's also home of the fattest muskies in the world, a lot of people say. Um, if not, uh, pretty darn close to it. They've got photos and, and, and evidence to show you that uh, it, it's not just a story, it's the truth. And so we look really forward to having Marlon on here next week and exploring that fishery. In the second part of our show, February 1st, um, told you we're going to do shows on all the different baits and bait styles. We are doing a crankbait show. And I have two crankbait, um, two of my crankbait heroes coming to do this show for the first part uh, i have uh, noah clark who from clarky baits um i just got this one in the mail i'm gonna crush this on this next year i'm gonna catch double digits on this bait next year so noah um, i'm a big fan i can't wait to have you on there and then bryn roach um again just just as good as they get these days for crank baits for wooden baits um they're not only artwork they are durable. This bait has been in the water for a lot of hours and caught a bunch of fish. It still looks brand new. We're going to find out things like how do you build those baits? What do the different lips do? The different actions? Um, everything you wanted to know about a crankbait. And then in the second part of the show, we're bringing in Billy Barber. Uh, if you don't know Billy, Billy's a St. Lawrence. I was going to say a St. Lawrence legend, but no, Billy's just a legend in musky fishing, period. If you're a musky fisherman, um, you should know Billy because he catches and has caught some of the biggest fish in the world year in and year out for a long time. So we're going to tap. Uh, he's a, a crankbait troller extraordinaire. Um, we're going to talk to Billy about some trolling tips with crankbaits. And we're going to talk to him about his observations um, in terms of what's going on on the St. Lawrence. Um, he's uh, uh, he's knowledgeable on a lot of the current research. and. You know, he watches fish spawn. He's spent a long time on the river. He's going to share those observations with us. Um, I think shortly we're going to have Sean Landsman, um, one of my heroes. And I'm going to talk about learning with Sean um, later on today, uh, learning learning through Project Noble Beast. Uh, but Sean is going to do a segment um, called Ask the Biologist or something similar to that, where he's going to take a couple of your questions on fish behavior or biology. Um, so if you have questions that come to mind now, send them in um, and he's gonna answer them in the following week. We're gonna collect the best questions from each week. Um, next week, I think Sean is gonna come on and answer um, a question that he's gonna answer first and you'll get the answer to if you go to the Muskies Canada Ottawa chapter meeting online tomorrow night. Why are there so many different fish colors and Tell us all about them. In the Ottawa River, we have all the different color patterns. We have uh, barred muskies. We have spotted muskies. We have muskies with no color at all called clear pattern muskies. Um, and we have naturally occurring tigers. So how do we have all of these different looks and then all of the, the sub looks and, and how do they stay separate instead of becoming homogenized? And what does that mean about behavior? So um, a really first interesting answer from Sean. Can't wait to bring that into the show. Let me take a breath. I'm talking a little bit fast and a little bit long.
diet ginger ale, no caffeine, great late in the day. Let's talk about learning. And I thought a really interesting way to, to broach this subject with you is to show you one of my favorite books. And this is, uh, this is a book by Bert Claflin, and it's called Musky Fishing. Now, I just looked inside. My copy's from 1948. I was pretty sure this was written in the early 30s. Um, it's about the Wisconsin musky fishery, um, the central and northern U.S. fishery for the most part. And it's a, a writer from Chicago, which is the center of the musky fishing world in the U.S. More musky fishermen per capita out of there than anywhere else, probably. And the lands that they go to fish in, which is basically all through Wisconsin. So there's a ton of history in this book and it's laid out as a collection of short stories on people and places um tactics and characters um that he finds along the way and it's got all the wisdom of the day you know um it's got stories about how muskies live to be a hundred years old um it's got stories about how the populations of muskies are so thick in the lakes in wisconsin that there could never ever be a problem with the with managing these populations or running out of muskies. Uh, it talks about how muskies are poisonous. Um, getting bit by a muskie can almost be fatal. There's a great story about how they rushed a guy who got um, bit unhooking a muskie in the boat. Um, and they got him to the hospital just in time to save his fingers after a long journey um, using fruit and vegetables for lures. My favorite line, one of my favorite, well, favorite line, <laughs> just because it, it, it just shows how much has changed is uh, it, it took Timmy 15 minutes to get the fish close enough to the shore for me to shoot it with my Luger. And so um, the point being that, you know, learning is um, something that is a continuous and evolving project um, for musky fishermen. We always think that we have it all figured out at any point. In history, we think our current knowledge, you know, we know everything. We, have, we got it figured out. And then you learn a little bit more through research or through experience. And then you realize, oh, oh, there was, you know, actually, I guess near the tip of the iceberg, there was so much more um, learning to do. And so in the musky fishing world, your learning is progressive, you know, and progressive and cumulative. Um, the more you learn, the more fish you'll catch and the more learning you do, um, the more your knowledge adds up so that you can figure out that puzzle on a, on a day by day, uh, you know, on a day by day uh, basis out on the world. And then current, current knowledge is so important now because, you know, the musky world um, is changing faster than at any point in history. You know, you have invasive species coming in all over North America. And whenever something comes in, something else moves out. And our North American fish aren't good at competing with, for example, gobies um, on the St. Lawrence. You know, they've had a devastating effect. Red crayfish on, on the um, Lake of the Wood system. You know, from when I was a kid, there was rich and lush beds of cabbage on the Lake of the Wood system. Rust, rusty crayfish, sorry, rusty crayfish came in and ate a lot of most of the weed bits, you know, and that changes the habitat. You need to find out how to deal with that. Um, weeds, one of the, the common things that we notice on the, the Ottawa River is the weed beds and the weed systems have really changed in the last 15, 20, 25 years. And that changes how fish relate to the weeds. And weeds are, you know, weeds are a huge part of uh, musky behavior we'll talk about that as we go you know and i hear i hear the old guys in my fishing world um saying they don't catch fish anymore you know because they go out and did what they used to do 15 and 20 years ago those tactics don't uh, um don't hold up you know the fish are a lot smarter weeds have changed um a little bit uh, other things change on your body of water so those are all the reasons why you need to stay current and up to date. Lisa, I see you uh, there on the screen. Interrupt. Yes. 
We are. We have a little bit of an audio issue, issue, John. When you put your book down, things went really funny. So I don't know if it's, if it's near your mic or something. Okay. There How's we go. That? Is that That's, any better? That's perfect. I'll get out of here now. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Lisa. It's so nice to have you have somebody uh, tell you these things. I don't want to know anything about production. <laughs> I want to be a Luddite. Declare that uh, right up front. Um, for me, there's four key learning, four key areas of learning. Um, behavior of individual fish and populations. And so I'm going to talk for a few minutes on behavior. Two, tactics and skills. We'll just touch on that. That's such a big and broad category. And a lot of our future lessons, our uh, future programs, um, we'll get into specific tactics. Like I said, the crankbait show, we're going to do a soft uh, soft plastic show, a jerkbait show. Um, you know, we're going to look at how to attack a day, um, what kind of plan you want to make going out. And so um, tactics and skills, those sort of things are uh, uh, big topics unto themselves. Technical learning and new technology. Um, again, a huge topic we'll talk on more, but... Um, I've had a whole bunch of technical epiphanies in the last couple of years. Just um, I've upped my technology game and that is so essential. We'll talk on that. And then I wanted to talk to you about the most important learning that you do as a muskie angler and especially as a new muskie angler. And that's um, acquiring knowledge on how to handle and release muskies. Um, that is the most important piece of information that you're going to learn um, as an angler. And so uh, I'm going to tell you, you need to have a plan when you get a 50 inch fish at the side of your boat and in your, you know, and in your net. And what do you do at that time? Because it's going to happen. It's going to happen when you least expect it. I know a lot of people whose first fish is a 50 inch fish. Um, I fished with Stefan Pigeon, Stefan and Matt Pigeon, and Stefan's first muskie was 55 inches, you know, this past December. So, you know, the, an important question to ask yourself is, do you have the knowledge, the equipment, and the tools to deal with that fish when you catch it? Because going and catching it is one set of knowledge, but the reasons behind why you need to make sure that fish swims away alive are profound. And so um, I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, about, you know, the importance of one muskie in a population. When you're trying, muskies are the apex predator in any system. Um, in the Ottawa River, there's over 90 species of fish. The balance between the apex predator, the fish at the top, and the other 90 species of fish is a, a, a very, very precarious one. When you start losing members of the apex predator population, which is smaller than just about all the other members um, uh, that are in, inhabiting the system, um, you can really lose balance in a system fast and populations can change immensely. So um, two or three big fish that die out of a bay or out of river mouth, for example, that would eat for example, um, dozens and dozens of pike over the course of the season. Uh, pike and muskies compete. You know, in the Kawartha Lakes, we've watched um, pike come in, come in, and it's amazing how fast the population changes from just muskies to a few pike to a lot of pike. And so, maintaining that balance is absolutely essential. Every single fish going back in the condition that you found it is absolutely essential. And you know, um, I do a thing in a lot of my talks um, on Canadian muskies versus American muskies. There's incredible fisheries in, in, in Canada and in the States. Um, there's wild fisheries in both places. But, you know, I'll give you a quick overview on what you have in Ontario. Um, I've spent a lot of time in Ohio and Pennsylvania. Um, amazingly fanatical uh, um um, musky fisheries, um, um, places with a whole lot of musky fishermen, probably, a, a, I don't know, maybe over 100 musky fisheries in, in those two 
in those two states, they have almost no natural reproduction in those states. A muskie lives to, now my, not, my data is a few years out of date, but a muskie lives to 13 or 14 years max in those states. Um, you know, as of a few years back, they grow um, all, because all of their fish are stocked and they're really good at stocking and growing fish down there. And they have a lot warmer water and that dictates growing seasons. You know, they can grow, I read years ago, about Elmer Hayob growing, uh, his guys growing a 48 and a half inch muskie in five years in, in uh, Ohio. You know, that is incredible. Your fisheries in Canada, we do not stock anywhere right now in Canada. All your fish are there through natural reproduction. Um, we did not pollute our gene pools initially because we didn't um, erode our bodies of water and our system still supported natural reproduction. So you have wild muskies that live to 30 years old that are bigger and badder and stronger fish and, and just more resilient muskies. They are, you know, um, the top, the top, top muskies on the planet. All muskies are gold. What you have here in Ontario, this is the epicenter of muskies in the world right here. That's why it's important to learn that catch and release that hand, those handling skills first. And where do you learn that? That is a skill best learned with someone who's done it. Um, go out with an experienced fisherman let somebody show you how to use the tools. Um, you know, you owe it to a muskie to have the right tools in your boat if you're going to go and fish for them. So that giant net, that's the best release tool that you have. Hook cutters, the long flyers, all of those things, you know, you just owe it to the fishery uh, to have those if, if you're going to go out to begin with. And then learning to handle that fish, that 30-pound giant muscle in your hand how to hold that control it how to not put it on the floor of your boat how to get a hook out that's deep in the throat of a hook that is best taught by experience you know so um i'll talk about fishing with with other people in other places in a few minutes but you know learning that handling that's really something you want to do um elsewhere an overview of musky behavior you you know you guys have seen my routine at a lot of different shows over the years. Um, I always talk basics of musky behavior because you got to understand the why of what you're doing. And if you understand what you think the fish is doing or based on the conditions that face you, then you can make an intelligent decision on what tactics to use, on what baits and what colors and how fast to fish. So, you know, the musky game is all about reading conditions matching the behavior to the conditions and then with what you see in the water and then matching the tactics to that so basics of musky behavior you know what is a musky a musky is the biggest baddest fastest swimming fish in fresh water in north america um it is the apex predator in our systems it has burst speeds over 50 kilometers and 50 kilometers an hour um, speed is more of a factor for our fish um, in terms of how that fish hunts and in terms of us appealing to it with bait so you know learning to to use speed and understanding that it's really almost too hard to go too fast most of the times is a, an essential piece of, of learning that you know a lot of people get on early and then later it's just the opposite of that because most of you guys a lot of people only fish at 100 miles an hour and learning to slow down and when to slow down and when to go real slow when your fish are inactive because the conditions are making them that way. You know, that's, that's the other end of the curve. So that the speed factor, um, critical, 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 critical learning. Um, a lot of my musky behavior is learned through telemetry studies. And so, um, a telemetry study is putting a transmitter on a fish and following it around for a period of time. So my mentor in the muskie world is my high school basketball coach, Ken Stunnell. He took me up to Menaki, Ontario, where I was a kid in the 70s. And that's where I started guiding. And Ken put an article 
in my hand um, by Bernard LeBeau, I think about 1980. And I looked for it. I have a couple copies around here. I couldn't find it. But, you know, it's the first telemetry study ever done on muskies. And I was fascinated with this as a learning tool from that point. I was as fascinated them as I am today. And I will tell you that, you know, there, there are so many different ways to learn, but uh, um, a lot of learning is people who catch fish telling you what fish, you know, what they think fish do um, based on their experience. And anecdotal evidence is a huge source of knowledge. Um, there's no knowledge like the knowledge you get, um, like the knowledge that you get from time on the water. But telemetry studies place specific fish in exact locations at specific times. And in the modern day, they monitor movement. Stephen Cook has got transmitters on fish with fields of transponders generating data points of movement, when they move and what they move on. So, you know, that kind of learning is the stuff that really appeals to me. Sean Landsman, who I mentioned earlier, wrote um, Project Noble Beast. I encourage any or all of you to go and have a look at that study. It's uh, transmitters on fish in the Rideau and on the Ottawa River, and it is groundbreaking. It's so groundbreaking, Muskie Hunter has published it, I think, a couple of times. Um, it was revered by the, uh, the, the reviews of the science community. And, you know, there's the science that goes into that study, and that is so fascinating on its own. Participating in those studies through Muskies Canada, just an incredible, uh, an incredible um, opportunity. If you don't want to do any of that, what do you take out of it as a fisherman? Well, um, you know, a behavioral constant out of that that I make a living off of is no matter what the conditions were, any time of day, any time of the year, um, any season, there was always fish in shallow on the good weed structures. And that's whether you see them or not. And not seeing muskies is a big part of musky fishing, you know, we just don't come across them. Sometimes they don't want to move, you know, they're not there, but knowing that they are there, you know, versus wondering, it gives you a whole different way to it, uh, to go out and musky fish. Um, from that study as well, just an absolute bombshell you need to know as a musky fisherman, um, two thirds of the time muskies were on or near the bottom when Sean tracked them in that study. Um, and that study went all season long with with um, dozens and dozens of fish. Um, two thirds of the time they were on or near the bottom. So that's a really important, a really essential piece of learning if you're going to chase muskies. Um, two thirds of the time they're on or near the bottom. Bigger fish spend more time than smaller fish on the bottom. The older you get, the more time, the bigger you get, the more time you spend on the bottom. And so all of your giants are related to the bottom um, even more. And then you learn to read conditions that are conducive to putting fish on the bottom. So uh, giant, look, giant blue sky system and ultra high pressure, your fish are laying on the bottom. Post frontal after the storm, your fish are most likely laying on the bottom. Cold water, you know, it takes a lot of energy to move. Your fish are laying on the bottom. Current situations, you know. And so recognizing your fish are on the bottom and matching um, your fishing to what they're doing on the bottom. You know, if they're on the bottom, they're either negative or neutral. That's the, the two terminologies that we use. And a neutral fish, you know, both of those fish are catchable. But a neutral fish is catchable and you can appeal it neutral means it kind of refers to how far a fish will go to chase your bait you know when they're active they're up and moving and they chase stuff and they'll travel to hit stuff when they're neutral they won't travel very far and when they're negative they are glued to the bottom and you need to get really close to that fish really slowly with something that appeals and so you know we'll talk more each episode as we go along on these concepts, but those are some of the key basics of uh, musky learning uh, of behavior that you need to have to help yourself catch more fish. 
I wanted to talk about time on the water as a learning tool. Um, there is no substitute for time on the water. And I'll say different partners in different places um, teach you and up your game. Um, there is a whole lot of regional knowledge in the musky world still. The people in the Midwest, in the U.S., fish differently than the people in Northern Ontario, fish differently than the people from New Jersey, fish fish differently than we out, do out here in Ontario. And, and all of those, you know, there's a lot of logic behind all of those tactics and systems, and it's really neat to analyze the differences. Um, I would end up with an hour presentation, just me talking to you if I went into those, but you know, what you learn through travel, we'll touch on that with Frank. Um, he's really upped his game in terms of partners and, and places. So we'll broach this with him, getting that regional knowledge. Um, you know, epiphany moments and learning, some of the things that I got by by traveling and listening to other people or, um, you know, Mike Lazarus, the first time I saw Mike speak at a Muskie Canada event in the 90s, and he talked about 50-50s. 50, 50 inch fish. And I went away with my head spinning, you know, just wondering if that was even in the realm of possibility. And, you know, turns out it is. And, 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 and it's more common than you think in the modern day. Um, you know, Mike was probably one of the first people to get to say that. Spencer Berman out on Lake St. Clair, one of the craziest things anybody said to me. Uh, I was fishing off of a school of, uh, giant school of shad a couple one to two kilometers long and spencer said how many muskies do you think are off that school and i hadn't thought about it and he said two thousand by his best count and just wow how can that be you know and yet it was so information in the musky world um so valuable there's no sheriff to sort it out for you and nobody to tell you if it's misinformation or Somebody's just feeding it to you to sell you stuff or making stuff up. So, you know, good, reliable sources, good, reliable people. Um, technical basics, essential part of learning. That's just what you learn in a boat as well. Boat control, I want to tuck on. Uh-oh. Hey, Lisa, how you doing? Good. Everything's great, actually. We just had some really good feedback from fellow Muskies Canada member Ryan Pickering. Uh, you were okay. You were touching on the subject of release tools, and he's got yep. a fantastic picture he wants to, to share with everybody. So I'd like you to kind of touch on that a little bit. Wow, we're giving Ryan and, and the uh, Kitchener Waterloo chapter a, a plug <laughs> already early. We were going to give them one later. What do you got? <laughs> yeah, so like you said, the release tools. I mean, that is that's the that's the whole package and then some. That's incredible. And another noticeable point, really crucial. You know, these tools, the quality tools are expensive and it's super, super important to be using your uh, your leashes because it's so easy for them to go over the side of the boat when you're dealing with the muskies. So that's an awesome setup, Ryan. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, you know, I had a bunch more things to say, but I always talk too much <laughs> on uh, my seminars and presentations and, you know, on the release tools, maybe that's not a bad place for us to leave off. Maybe give me another moment or two Hit me with another question, if you could, Lisa. Um, just before, I want to get to Frank. And so um, I wanted to recommend a couple of, couple of books, Old Style Learning. Uh, this is Muskies on the Shield. This is written by Dick Pearson. Do fish Northern Ontario, uh, Canadian Shield waters, um, clear trout waters, hard to fish waters. Um, this is a book about love. Uh, this is a man who's in love with musky fishing, in love with Canadian shield waters, a very smart man who just gives you different perspectives on learning. Um, I wanted to plug Jimmy Sarek's book, um, Fishing Muskies My Way. Um, Jimmy's book will teach you approaches uh, to learning in the modern day, and he'll teach you about going to new water, uh, especially. Um, really good learning. And I wanted to plug Bill Hamblin's book. Um, I think he's the latest Muskies Canada guy to write a book. Uh, he wrote 120 Days. And I just like that book. Um, 120 Days is a muskie season for a fanatical muskie angler. And Bill is a Georgian Bay legend. And if you get to follow him day by day through a muskie season. So three um, great pieces of 
learning right there. I mentioned Muskie Hunter magazine and TV show. Um, both of those um, just essential places to learn since um, prop for over 40 years. You know, Jim Zarek, just one of the best ambassadors that we have, one of the smartest guys in the musky fishing world. Uh, um, you know, and he's he's passed. He's passed the uh, the magazine on to uh, to Greg Thomas um, and Tony Grant. Um, again, two of the most experienced guys in the musky world as well. So a great place to learn from. Learning online, you're doing that now. Two people I wanted to plug. Gord Pizer. Um, my nickname for Gord is Google in a boat. Gord knows. He's not a generalist. Gord knows about every fish but he doesn't know something about every fish he knows everything about every fish and all the current knowledge so um if you want to learn muskies or anything about behavior uh, anything that gord puts out is gold and aaron weave from uh, uncut angling um somebody else i recommend just cutting edge stuff aaron um never talked to you but man i'm a big fan i love what you've done with video i love the teachable moments that you create in in the modern sense and uh wow your shows are just entertaining and high quality so um lisa if you've got a question you can pull it up um musky tactics how to fish a day that's a future topic reading conditions again a future topic pressure changes everything um a big topic we're going to deal with as well down the road probably do a whole show on pressured muskies as well and i know you're there lisa come on we're pretty good john actually i think we're uh we're, we're covering most of these things which is fantastic so okay okay um i'm i'm ready to to introduce frank was there any questions that anybody had on that first part of the show again as we go along um Feel free to send your questions along. Oh, I did want to give one plug. This is a this is a plug for the uh, Muskie Factory Bait Company um, Lure Retriever. Um, I talked about muskies being a bottom dwelling creature, and so fishing close to the bottom is something that I do a lot. And shall I fish shallow water so I can be close to the bottom? Uh, if I'm fishing deeper, I'm always fishing at least one bait close to the bottom. Our baits cost a fortune these days. Um, we sell this for eighty dollars. You with a with a line, you pull two baits off of the bottom. You feel like the smartest person in the world, and it won't take you very long this season until you snag two baits on the bottom. So the Musky Factory baits lure retriever. Um, check it out on the Musky Factory baits um, website or the Musky Factory baits store online. I see a question from Rob Dykins. How deep in the Ottawa River would you go before you're wasting your time? Wow, what a good question, Rob. You know, you could probably catch, I had somebody tell me they caught a muskie in 80 or 85 feet of water. And uh, it, it just makes you cringe when somebody tells you that because probably that fish is gonna die. I see muskies on out in 50 and 60 feet of water, 40, 50, and 60 if I'm fishing in big water. Um, I know that they're muskies, you know, and often later in the day they move up shallow. Fishing those fish is, you have to set your own morality. As a muskie fisherman, everything we do is to make that fish survive. I already told you that. Pulling that fish out of 50 or 60 feet of water is probably fatal. Um, myself, I don't go any deeper than 25, 28 feet of water. I only do that in the fall when the water is cooler and the fish can, uh, the, the fish are much tougher and they do not create stress at nearly the same rate in, uh, in the fall, in the cooler water as they do. One of the biggest contributing factors, um, to stress in a fish is water temperature as evidenced through Project Noble Beast, um, you know, one of the great learning pieces out of it. And if you want to fish deep, 
you have to have a lot of line out. You know, if you're going to troll deep, generally you have a lot of line out. Your fight is a lot longer. It's just not as good for the fish, Rob. So, you know, you decide for yourself, but you can't, you can't make them one fish muskies. You're going to destroy the fishery that you love by doing that. So great question. Thanks. Um, Frank Ungaro has been sitting in the wings waiting watching me ramble for a long time. Frank um, is the host of the Ugly Podca Pike podcast series. So um, I said Frank's got a different perspective on on uh, on learning. And Frank, in you know, I believe a lot in modeling in life. Um, you can achieve success by finding somebody else who's achieved success, learning what they learn, doing what they do by modeling their behavior. And so, you know, that's the best way to learn. That's the way that I've learned a lot of things in life. And so, you know, when I first met Frank, we were talking and, and we're, we're, we're both combat sports fans. And I said to Frank, you know, um, UFC, man, when I watched UFC one way back when, you know, that, that night changed my life in terms of being a combat sports fan. Um, I, you know, I watched the, the, the UFC and martial arts, uh, been a fan for a long, long time. And so, you know, it changed my perspective. And Frank said, yeah, you know, he said that night changed my my perspective too. He said the next day I called Hoist Gracie, who's the guy who won that. And Hoist was, I think, the smallest guy in the competition fighting guys up to 660 pounds. And Hoist, when he said, I called Hoist Gracie and I, I said, Hoist, how do I learn what you know? And then I started going out to California to to work with Hoist, and I just thought that's uh, that's obsessive learning. You're going to do really, really well in the musky world, Frank. And and then as soon as Frank decided he wanted to, you know, he wanted to up his game in the musky world, um, he got the bug bad. It happens to all of us. It just it bites you one day. You catch your first fish, you see it, and and you just you just need to go on that trip. And so Frank's journey has been. Uh, um, one of his big learning curves is fish a lot of different places. I cut his learning curve. His journey's been fish a lot of different places with a lot of different people and to interview um, 80 of the who's who of the musky world. Um, experienced guides, biologists, lure makers, uh, resort owners, just everybody and anybody. And in interview them in depth to learn what they've learned. So we're going to try and pick some of that knowledge out of Frank today. Lisa, do you have some pictures to show? There's Frank. Awesome. Hey. <laughs> nice, nice to see you, Frank. We're Good still not going to let you talk for a second because, you know, I'm again, I'm a big fan of the, the photographs that we get out there and, and your stuff. It's so different and off the charts. Um, Lisa, is it possible that you can show those, those photos? John, I, I want to see some of the ones you showed at first because I got some really cool context uh, of, of a couple of the ones you showed at first um, because, you you know, you talked about fishing, uh, shooting where you're fishing and stuff. I mean, I was like doing handstands and, and laying on my neck for a couple of those pictures just, just to get the perfect shot and get out of the way of the light. So it, it's, it's, it's crazy sometimes. Yeah. I got them all, all lined up for it. I'll put it on now. Okay? All right. Well, and, you know, not shooting the Griffin Grin shot, it's just taking it to another level. So this is the one that Frank took in, in December out right. in the boat, just as it's getting dark and, you know, just different perspective. Um, got the elation in my face. Uh, netted that fish for me a moment earlier. Yeah. And what was neat about that is the fish went in the net and the whole team, nobody said a word. Everybody knows. Two guys going for cameras, one guy releasing. <laughs> one guy get that hook out. It's like, okay, all right. Next step, fish yeah. up, pictures, different angles. All right, fish in the water. You know, just yeah. the way that it's supposed to happen. So and, and the I, next one. I knew you were looking at the GoPro that we had set up, and I wanted to get a different angle, but I couldn't. I couldn't even sit up because I would have gotten the the I would have gotten in the way of the light, and it would have obstructed the the fish's face. Um, and I, I remember being extremely uncomfortable snapping this shot, but. Uh, all I did was just like a hundred shots of this angle and just trying to keep myself as still as possible while being as uncomfortable as I could because that boat was wet and it was freezing cold. And, uh, but I mean, 
Look at it. I mean, we got a great shot. Oh, yeah. Shoot 100 shots or yeah. shoot it on video so that you can take it out after. But shoot yeah. it fast, however you do it. Mm -hmm. Next photo, Lisa. So this one, I just wanted to call attention to everybody. Like we had some poor light conditions, obviously. This this season, this was on Lac Sul. And this season, man, we got every fish at dark. It was crazy. But uh, I just wanted to call attention to like a lot of people hold the fish out to make them bigger and stuff. Chris, that's Chris, my my co-host, uh, Chris Walter for the Ugly Pike podcast. Chris goes about 6'3", 230. So that's a massive fish. And, uh, John, that was your bait that saved the day on that fish. That was your – I think you call it salt and pepper, the white the awesome. white cocktail, double ten. Yeah, black yeah. black pepper and salt. That's our, that's our own uh, our own custom skirt, absolutely. Yes, that Thanks. thing – that thing was – that that year, 20 – this was 28 – 2018, that 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 lure and the Gore Downey were our magnets up at Sewell. So uh, that that fish was a giant. That was Chris's first 50 inch class fish. Wow, good context. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate the plug. Keep going, Lisa. <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, I don't have much to say about that. Alex takes great pictures. I mean, he just he knows how to hold. He know he just knows what to do. Um, yeah. There's nothing much, much more to say about that. You know, I'll, I'll say something on that one. That was a fish that we caught on a summer pattern fishing in November. And that's because the water temperature, you know, we were speed trolling. Yeah. Um, we were speed trolling in lines up high in November, which is a stupid strategy normally. But yeah, the water really held its temperature. Yeah. And then we had a crazy week of warmth, like, like, October 30th, November 1st um, this year. And the temperature of the water dictated um, how we should be fishing. You know, mm -hmm. so, you know, don't go by the calendar. The The water temperature is your calendar when, when you're a fisherman. Yeah, yeah. And just the last picture with the, um, with the escarpment there. Um, I, I love this picture so much. And when I hear myself telling people about how nice shield waters are, and how nice, you know, up at Eagle Lake and how beautiful. I think it's really easy to overlook uh, Ottawa, the Ottawa River, especially at this time of year. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, and it, I, 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 it's I just that, love this picture. I, I love everything about it. Yeah. It's at its finest in, in the fall, too. I think that's uh, going down towards Hawkesbury, way down in the lower Ottawa. Lisa, keep yeah. going because those were our intro pictures, but we'll talk off of the. Uh, yeah. We're going to talk. Yeah. yeah, I think you, you can go ahead. I know you want to talk uh, some of that. So uh, I'm, again, I'm doing like a neck stand trying to get out of the way of the sun and the light. It, this was such a tough picture to get, but I got it. And uh, this was us up at Lac Sewell. This is Chris's second 50-inch class fish and the nicest fish probably either of us have ever caught. Um, and this was – three or so hours left in our trip where we had a couple nice fish in the boat, but certainly not what we were going up there for. And we were, we hadn't, we saw, we caught one tiny fish in 23 hours and we were being guided by Ben Beatty up there. And, uh, we were, we had, we had no ideas left. We were in such a lull and we were miserable. Nobody was talking to each other. I, I swear we went hours without a word in the boat. And uh, Ben said, let's let's put on baits we haven't used and let's do some jerk trolling. And we're like, well, you know, and uh, we're sitting there unconscious, just popping our rods like out of it. And then this thing just, you know, we went from zero to rocket fuel in about a half a second. And it was on. This was uh, probably the funnest fish I've ever been a part of catching. It was just it was just an epic moment for us all. Wow. Yeah. Uh, how you said jerk jerk trolling, Frank. You know, that's not something that most people have in their repertoire. And so, you yeah. know, you got Ben Beatty, who's a legend up on Sewell, um, you know, teaching you something something like that. How fast are you going? Um, to be honest, John, I don't I don't quite remember. I, I think we were probably going three or four miles an hour, but I don't I don't remember the number. It, despite it being the summer, we weren't going that fast because yeah. If you're going super fast jerk trolling, you're not going to want to do that at five or six miles an hour. You're going to kill yourself. And like we were dead. We were, this was day five, last two, three hours. And so like we had nothing in the tank. So I don't remember John, but I can't imagine he was going too fast. I don't remember being under stress when we were doing that. 
Yeah, jerk trolling is generally something that you do going slower. And if your fish aren't biting, if you're not catching them doing normal tactics, it's so hard for most guys to slow down. And so you slow down right at the end of a, a butt kick trip, which, yeah. you know, all of us have had butt kick trips. It's just part of musky fishing. You know, if, yeah. if, if you're a musky fisherman, catching no fish is part of what you do. It just happens. Yeah. It doesn't matter who you are. So, man, nice way to finish. Yeah. What do you got, Lisa? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say now about that, that picture? One, that was one again that we took off of a video camera. And again, if you want to take a group photo, you know, set your video up again. The fish just up for the photo. All right, move it around back in the water, and you still pick a good photo out of it. Fun and, fall fish again. Go yeah. ahead. And guys, like pull that head down when you're taking that picture. Pull that head down. The fish, the fish just looks so much cooler. I think. There you go. Wow, this one, the last one's kind of cut off, but what a neat underwater release shot, a half yeah. and half. So this picture, just like the one of Chris releasing that giant head into the water, uh, we don't use poles or extensions or anything like that. So these pictures are us, um, like our belt loops touching the gunnel and our bellies touching the tops of the water and stretching out as long, you know, and as long as we can to get different angles. And uh, this is with video because you want to traverse the water line and uh, and look in and, and just like painstakingly looking through the frames for that for that cut shot. And uh, yeah, this was a pretty cool one. That was in Alex's boat this year. I I don't even remember where we were fishing, but uh, we had a lot sure, of trip this year. Sure, sure, you don't. But we'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you we're got? On, next? We're on the Ottawa <laughs> River. <laughs> um, again, just just a, a, a wild scenery photo you know um yeah yeah th that, yeah just just seeing the moment and taking that i love that and i think the last one the last one is a tell-all picture if if you go to that one lisa yeah i just this is one of my personal favorites i think this is alex uh taking a shot of you but that's um that's that's fishing from outer space um, and if you own a photo like that, um, you are hardcore and beyond. If you're out in December and you think getting in the boat with snow on the ground and all over your boat like that's a good idea, that says everything you need to know about this guy right there. Um, <laughs> that's the hardest of the hardcore right there. So I oh, love that photo, yeah. Frank. Um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question, and I'm, I'm going to leave you to answer it for a moment. Sure. Um, I see that I need to find a power cord for my phone. So let me hit you up with the first question. Um, how did you and, and Chris um, get the idea for the Muskie, uh, uh, for the Ugly Pike podcast? Tell me about the formation going from idea to creating the show to creating an incredible library of, uh, of 80 episodes of deep, deep learning. Mm -hmm. Why don't you take us on that journey for a moment? Sure. And I'll be right back with a power cord. All right. Well, um, you know, this this was never really supposed to be anything that anybody watched, to be honest. <laughs> we uh, we started this podcast uh, on a quest for fast-tracking our own knowledge. And uh, I've said this on the show, but um, it's a true story. I told Chris if we ever got 100 people to download the show that we would consider it a success. And, uh, you know, three years later, we're – uh, we smashed 100,000 downloads uh, back in October, I think it was. Um, and so, you know, we just uh, – we, we had a couple episodes. We debuted at the uh, at the Musky Odyssey several years ago. And, uh, you know, the, geez, I don't know why people even kept listening. Our sound was so bad. Um, we were not great as broadcasters. We didn't have any experience. And, uh, you know, I was so new to musky fishing, John, when, when we had our episode with you, I, I didn't even know who the hell you were. So it, uh, listening back at that episode, I cringe, uh, at some of the questions I asked you, but, uh, you know, uh, Chris and I are both kind of cut from the same cloth and, and Chris, especially Chris is, Chris is very meticulous, very professional, very driven. And, uh, and so it didn't take us long for us to want to, um, 
invest in the podcast. And so we invested in some more equipment. We invested in some software. We got our sound to an acceptable level. Uh, and then we got some really cool guests. And, you know, one guest, uh, one good guest was all we needed to take that name to another guest and say, you know, these guys are doing our show. And uh, would you do the show? And, and so we, it just rolled from there. That's a shot of our studio that uh, we started the podcast in. That fish is a 50 inch plus um, real mount, an old one of, uh, uh, of an Ottawa river muskie. So as I mean, talk about weird as we were, as we were planning this, um, this podcast, I, I had a business associate say to me, uh, do you have any use for a 50 inch stuffed Ottawa river muskie? And I mean, <laughs> we were just in the midst, literally in the midst of, uh, decorating our studio. I'm like, yeah, are you kidding me? So uh, everything just seemed to come together. And uh, the more we invested in the show, the more people kind of took to it. And, um, you know, the real turning point for the show was when we had Al Linder on. And uh, Al Linder and Jeremy Smith. And, and at that point, we went from downloads at every release to downloads every hour of every day, whether or not we were releasing material. So, um, you know, that, that's kind of how we got started. Wow, Al Linder, one of my absolute um, absolute fishing heroes. I know you've had Gord Pizer and Jim Sarek. I'm just going to go back to that 50-inch um, real skin mount muskie that you had uh, that you had uh, that that we showed. And just just to comment for people, um, that is a true collector's item because you can't you can't harvest a muskie. Um, the the limit on the Ottawa River is 54 inches, and so there will never be another 50 inch mounted muskie out of the Ottawa River. It's a 54 inch limit, and that limit only exists at 54 because with a 54 inch length, um, you can have a girth that's big enough to have a world record muskie. Um, and so, cool. you know, that 50 inch mount you have, very rare, very cool. Yeah, it's 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 a special fish. Um, it was very special to my friend, and I was really honored that he passed it on to me. So I take good care of it. You know, it's been in our studio for a while, and uh, yeah, I mean, for all the reasons you said it more. Wow, um, you've talked to so many people. Um, I guess eighty so far, uh, somewhere around there. Um, who stands out, or what stands out um, in terms of the interviews that you did? in terms of a personality or maybe a key learning moment? <laughs> personality, honest. Um, this is going to be such a weird answer, but we were sitting in the lodge on Eagle Lake and uh, we just finished having dinner and we were at Andy Myers Lodge. And at this lodge, you sit with other people. So you'll have eight, six, eight people at your table. And at first it's kind of awkward, but it doesn't take long for you to get to know everybody and, and start swapping stories and, after dinner, um, we went out, we, we fished a little bit, we came back in, and uh, in the lodge where there's this uh, father and son that were sitting there, and we started having drinks with them, and the, this guy was so out, like just out into left field, but in a great way, that I ran and grabbed our microphone and turned the switch on, and it's an earlier episode, but it's uh, Ryan and Jerry DeLay, D-U-L-L-E-A, I think, um, and you can go to uglypikepodcast.com, any podcast app. Uh, our website has embedded players you can listen or download, but that episode is so, I mean, talk about a personality. This guy tells a story about how he used to tie Eppinger daredevils to his big toes and, and swim across his lake uh, trying to get pike to bite. I mean, yeah, <laughs> what happens when you get a 40 and you're swimming in 50 feet of water? So, I mean, you want to talk, I mean, this is not an answer people probably expected. They probably expected you to say, you know, whoever, but man. That was such a cool episode. I actually listened to it yesterday because I'm like memory <laughs> memory lane, man. I loved it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the answer that I was expecting either. And, you know, just more proof that the musky world has uh, more characters and more eccentrics and, and more fun than uh, yes, more fun than any other any other group of people that fish. Um, Lisa, do you have any questions that have been sent in for uh, for Frank? <laughs> uh, Jerry also tells a story about how his, his mother fried and ate Cisco's, used to fry and, and feed them bait. But anyways, I digress. <laughs> Go listen to the episode. Um, what what 
what were some key uh, some key pieces of musty knowledge that you got out of your interviews, maybe that um, you could pass yeah. on that that you know upped your game, took you to another level. Honestly, like most of most of my real game changers have been in the boat, and I think you touched on that. Time on the water is is really important, and I'm not just saying this because it's you, but in your episode, um, in your episode, your episode with us really took a lot of the dauntingness away from learning how to musky fish. You said something that I never forget. You said um, you catch big fish where you caught big fish. And to me, that really made the lakes and rivers that we fish in a lot smaller uh, in terms of identifying good structure and good water and then raising fish there and keeping good notes, whether it's on your, your electronics or, or your phone or whatever, and, and just going back and working those spots, not only in a given outing, but every season. Um, and you talked about a fish called Gertha that had been uh, located, I think, during Project Noble Beast, during telemetry studies, I think, if I'm wrong, correct me. Um, but Gertha was seen many years later, 100 yards from the first spot she was seen. And uh, I think about that a lot because, you know, um, I, I think about that a lot because, uh, I, you know, I, I, when we're targeting fish and we see big fish, we go back for them, so. Uh, absolutely. You know, that, that's, uh, that's, uh, you've hit on a real key piece of, of knowledge for hunting big fish. And that's, you know, in a lot of systems, fish want to do the same thing year after year. They want to spawn in the same place and not just the same bay, the exact part of the same bay. You know, and if the conditions allow them to do that, they'll do that. Then they're going to recuperate nearby. They're going to travel to their to their uh, home range and they're going to spend basically their whole summer in the same area whether you see them or not whether you catch them or not they're there and so you know what you said about keeping notes and logs um that's a big part of muskies canada is the the log program and it, it not only helps shape uh management of musky fisheries by providing that information to the ministry of natural resources but you know you start to learn the value of what your logs are, what your logs do for you as a fisherman every year. Cause you can go back and look at your spring or I go back and look at water temperatures. So if I'm going out and it's, it's 63 degrees in a spring, I'm going back and you know, I have every year where it went to 63 degrees. I look at where I caught fish and sure enough, you catch the big ones where you caught them before because they are, they, they're doing the same thing. They want to do the same thing for 30 years. Gertha that you talked about, that was a fish out of our 1994 um, telemetry study. And we caught her, uh, Eddie Lalonde and I caught her in 2000, 100 feet from where she was um, on July 3rd in 1994. So, you know, that was a, an epiphany moment for me in musky fishing. And, and I could tell you catching the same big fish on the same spot a lot including a 56 that we caught this year that I know showed up on a spot on basically the same temperature as it did a couple of years ago. So yeah, huge learning point, huge learning point, Frank. You know, Gord, Gord Pizer in, at the last uh, Odyssey when he made his, um, his speech, he showed a picture of his favorite most productive spot on Lake of the Woods. And it was a, a small channel between two small island points. And he said, you know, if it cast over here, you don't you don't get the fish. If you cast over there, you don't get the fish. But you got to cast right there and you're going to get the fish every time. So talk about spot on the spot and fish being in these local spots. Um, you know, he, he was really big on on that precision. Yeah, well, and, and you know, the, the Lake of the Woods fishery is so different than ours. Um, lakes and rock structured um, bodies of water are so different from rivers and 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 uh, silt covered bottoms. So you know, in in like anywhere in the Canadian Shield area, if you're in a rock based system, once you learn a spot, if it's a good spot for a fish to sit, and the water is, you know, the water's close to the same level, there'll be fish there. You know, time after time for years and years. So you really build a repertoire of knowledge. You know. That, that your knowledge accumulates and that catches you more fish as you go down the road. 
you know, more key points in learning. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, wow. Um, you've got, I'm, I'm trying to, we're trying to make these episodes about, about 90 minutes long. And um, I'd hope to talk to you for longer, Frank, but I keep running my mouth off sometimes at the start <laughs> of the show. So, uh, and I, I, I want to get Dave Belil in here in a moment. So I'm going to ask you if there's any thoughts that you want to leave us with. And I'm going to ask you um, just to go over where people can find you on the Ugly Podcast. And you have a new lifestyle podcast as well. Tell us about that. Okay. So a uh, new lifestyle podcast called Always Be Choking. Um, I don't have anything published yet. Um, we were supposed to record the first episode today. It's going to happen tomorrow. We're going to talk about everything from investing to jujitsu, fishing, hunting, Everything. First guest is going to be Chris Howder, uh, one of my good friends and one of the first 12 black belts in North America. Uh, he's a legend. Uh, but we have a Facebook page, Always Be Choking. Go to that, Always Be Choking podcast. Follow us for updates, and we'll have everything set up and published really soon. Um, but parting words. Uh, yeah, a couple things. Um, number one, uh, Gord Pizer has a saying about um, musky fishing. He says it's brute strength and ignorance. And it's fun to throw that around, but it, I find it so true because I think we all doubt ourselves. I've been with really good anglers that in the boat can, boats can get down in the dumps about the way days are going. And I think it's important that everybody understands that everybody goes days or weeks without seeing fish at one point or another. And it's easy to get down on yourself, but the people who just – don't let that get the better of them and you power through it, the brute strength and ignorance part, powering through it and keep casting and keep trying to keep focused because that fish is going to show up when your spirit is broken and you're not going to make the move to get them to bite. So it's important to keep in mind that everyone gets a challenge uh, on the water and that's why we're musky fishermen. And someone had a question a while back about you know what, what makes a, a person a musky fisherman or something like that. And, um, and that's it. It's people that embrace that kind of, um, you know, uh, persistence uh, rising to the ultimate challenge. Muskie fishing is the ultimate challenge in freshwater angling. And I think it takes a special kind of person that wants to test themselves and wants to make sure that, uh, you know, they can come out on the other side of that challenge and they're not going to back down. Uh, that's the kind of person that muskie fishes, if you ask me. Really well put, Frank. I love that, man. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. What, a, right, what a what a treat to have you on the show. Um, what a treat to listen to what you and Chris made with the Ugly Podcast, uh, Ugly Pike Podcast series. Um, I'll continue to be a fan of that, and I look really forward to you and I sharing a boat again soon, my friend. All yeah, the best. Me too, John. Thanks for having me on. Take care. All right. All right. Onward. Uh, Dave Belisle, waiting in the wings. Can't wait to introduce Dave. Um, love this guy's passion. Um, just a smart, really well-rounded fisherman. Um, the Hamilton chapter of Muskies Canada, one of the ones with an awful lot of energy in Southern Ontario. Just a neat collection, a diverse collection of people. He'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, one of my, two of my favorite people in the Muskie world, I don't know if you have a picture of uh, Caden and Brian selfie. Lisa, come out of the Hamilton chapter. I was supposed to be down there last spring to do a talk live, and uh, Caden was going to come up and, and do some of it with me, explaining what, what he's learned. I've had the pleasure of fishing with these two guys um, the last three years. Caden uh, got the musky bug, came out to the Hamilton chapter meeting three years ago. Um, he's got the bug bad, and we get to get fish like that. We've been really lucky um, every year for three years. So shout out to, to Caden and Brian. And uh, without further ado, why don't you put Dave Belial on the screen? And, uh, and there he is, the man of the hour. Hey, Dave. Nice looking, ba nice looking basement there. Looks like you just cleaned that up. <laughs> Yeah, we've got an old house, and this is actually the garage, so it's a little chilly here. I've got a big, loud heater, but I shut that off, and I've got a little one next to me. So, uh, yeah, I tried to set it up a little bit, and uh, I've got this banner. I mean, I've never had any use for it yet, so I thought I'd use it tonight. Fantastic. Um, really happy to have you here. Um, a lot of our 
we, we've got uh, some Muskies Canada people that watch us, but we've got a whole lot of people from the States and non-Muskies Canada people that watch us. So, you know, why don't you tell us what is, uh, what's your chapter in Mus in uh, Hamilton um, all about? Why do people want to learn? Why would they want to join? What do they get out of it? What do they learn? All right, well, that's sort of a big question. I made a bunch of notes here and, uh, I think I should really start about with uh, Muskies Canada first and clarify that we're a not-for-profit organization and we're all volunteer. Um, with the Odyssey that you mentioned earlier, and, and uh, we don't we don't currently have have anything planned. Um, we're there's a bunch of smart guys that are working hard to try and figure something out, but but it's a good example of how we operate: not-for-profit, all volunteer. And and for that particular event, the reason I'm mentioning it is because 100% of the proceeds go to the fishery, and I think that's significant. Um, there's a lot of other shows and businesses and, and things that you'll you'll experience in the muskie world, and they're great. There's nothing wrong with them, but it's not so often that you find one that's entirely volunteer and all proceeds go to the fishery, um, primarily focusing on the Canadian muskie fishery. And and the neat thing about it being volunteer is you could be doing it. If, if you're sitting out watching this on, on your tablet or your computer somewhere, you know, two years from now, if you want to run the Odyssey, maybe you would be. Um, so a lot of people think, oh, volunteer, it means that, uh, you know, it's hard to organize and slow moving. We're a bunch of really keen guys, um, there's 600 of us. And, uh, you know, it tends to be that there's sort of a minority core that, that, uh, that are keen and, uh, and, and wind up sort of taking on things a little bit more actively, but, uh, it's pretty amazing when you have volunteers who are really passionate and really interested and tend to devote, devote a lot of their free time to something like musky fishing what can actually be accomplished. Um, so, so I mean, the, the Odyssey that John was talking about earlier was fantastic. I was there, I was one of the red shirts and, and I loved it. I mean, we were concerned that people were gonna get trampled at the beginning because everybody's just so keen, you know? I mean, we had all kinds of fantastic bait makers and big speakers and there were guys waiting there in the middle of the night. So I just wanted to, to say a little bit about Muskies Canada and, and point out that there's a bunch of very dedicated, passionate people. And uh, I, think th I think that that's a big deal. Um, we've got a great newsletter. Um, it's really more of a magazine. Lots of great information about what's happening here in, in the RJ. Um, but back to what uh, what you were talking about here, we've got uh, we've got Hamilton is one of thirteen chapters. So there's eleven in Ontario, one in Quebec, and one in New Brunswick. We've got. 600 members we were founded in 1978 and we still have old newsletters online for members to read and it's pretty cool to look back at that time as john was mentioning earlier you know he had an even older reference going back to the 1930s and they talked about shooting fish well it used to be that uh the people would recommend gaffing fish and and we've come a long way since then you know we're, we're very concerned about about our nets and we consider them alive well uh, we want to have a, a net that has a nice thick um, mesh so that the, the fish don't get cut and really we want to leave them in the water as much as we can um, if, if it's a big fish or if you want to take a photo great but there's a lot of guys in the club that ne never take them out so um, I guess you were asking about uh, why you'd want to become a member and I guess what I'd say a lot of people might already know this but uh, but I think it's worth mentioning that muskie are different than other fish here they're the apex predator they're hard to catch they're hard to handle without hurting them and really you need experience and tools um, help a lot as well, right? So going with somebody who's all set up and done it before makes it a lot easier. Um, there's a lot of gear involved between release tools, rods, reels, lines, leaders, bait. They're all bigger and more expensive. So if you show up at a meeting, I mean, more times than not, somebody's looking for a net man. Uh, if you've ever been out in a boat by yourself and, and netted a fish, um, it can be a bit of a challenge, especially if gear's scattered around, right? So there's a lot of people might have their own boat, but they'd really like to have somebody go out with them. It won't be obvious maybe on your first meeting, it might be a little bit hard to connect, but but it's there and, and most people are looking for help. Um, so I guess, I guess I'd guess i say that that'd be a big part of it. Um, I don't know, did I, did I answer your question a little bit there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of opportunities to learn, there's so many different ways to learn. You have such a di diverse membership. I know you have, you have some famous lure makers, you have, um, 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 some of the guys who published the release journal for us, um, biologists, people involved in in the research, all kinds of opportunities to learn through them. What about what about um, the opportunities to actually fish? 
if you're a Muskies Canada member or a Hamilton member. Um, you know, talk about the outings for a moment. Oh, the out outings are fantastic. We actually had ours, and it was a big success uh, in, in uh, October. I was pretty nervous because it was the first time that we had to have a, a deposit for the outing. Um, and we don't have a big budget. Um, we're not for profit. So basically, it could have meant that we, if we couldn't have the outing because of the pandemic restrictions, it would have meant that uh, we might have lost our deposit. So we didn't not only we, we didn't lose our deposit, but we, we made a little bit of money, um, which keeps us in good shape to proceed. But, uh, but the outings are fantastic. Basically, you have 30 or 50 guys come out. It's a good time to bring a buddy. There's uh, one day where everybody goes out and the person who catches the biggest fish gets a trophy. But a lot of guys show up a week earlier and try and figure the area out. Um, typically, we try and go somewhere a little bit further away than we normally would. So we've had our outings up on the French River at Totem Point and uh, Memquisit. And they've been fantastic. I mean, you wake up in October up there and there's this, uh, this sort of mist over the water and it's just such a beautiful part of the world. And you're up there with a bunch of guys that are really keen on musky fishing. So uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's just fantastic. You know, there's, there's a picture right there. So you wake up to that. You're with some of your best friends. You're going to go out and do something that you really enjoy. And, uh, and it's great. So um, we didn't have a typical prize, big prize table this year, but we did have box draws and we'll do the same again this year, hopefully. Um, so, so the outings are a big part of it, but uh I should also mention, it's not just our outing. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, there's a number of different chapters. I think there's uh, 11 in Ontario, and then there's uh, one in Quebec and one in New Brunswick. Each chapter has an outing. So if you can imagine, musky season is not quite that long, right? You typically have at least one a month, sometimes one every weekend during the peak, peak times. And then on top of it, National has, has some events. So there's a family day, and there's also wounded warriors, and, and there's a whole lot going on. So... Um, there's never a shortage of events you can get out to. Um, sometimes it's hard to make it to a bunch of other chapters outings unless you're really dedicated and well connected. But a lot of the guys are, I mean, in our chapter, we have guys that are going fishing every weekend. And again, people are always looking for a net man. So, so it's great to just show up and, and sort of make some friends, get some connections and, and figure out how it'd be easier to get on the water. Yeah, so many opportunities to go fishing you hit on there. The kids outing that we run every year is another, uh, Another hugely successful event. Um, and the events are spread out geographically all over the place. I mean, Dave, Dave mentioned that his chapter's been up in the Guartha Lakes, up on Georgian Bay, several distant, different destinations the past few years. So opportunities to fish all over the place um, with experienced people um, and, and to fish as a group. And, you know, I, I, keep, a, I, I keep a really active network here in Ottawa. You know, and I, every time I go out on the water, I find out who's out there and who I can talk to. You. And, you know, we like to hunt as a pack. We really like to hunt as a pack. So um, I hope you guys can hear me. I'm getting a note from Lisa that I got mic problems. But, uh, yeah, an awful lot, of, awful lot of opportunities to learn in a whole bunch of different ways that you touched on. And uh, um, I don't know of a better place personally to learn than through uh through muskies canada so so just, a, a lot of people a lot of people wouldn't really think of hamilton as being a, a musky fishing area um but really we're actually kind of centrally located i mean lake st Clair is huge the niagara river is is another area that's that's commonly fished for muskies i'm actually a member of the niagara muskie association association as well it's great to go to meetings on that side um, but we're also sort of the same distance to the Kawarthas and Georgian Bay as well. So the Ottawa is a little further for us and the St. Lawrence's as well. But we, we tend to wind up going to uh, Lake St. Clair, Georgian Bay, Kawarthas, or the Niagara. And we're kind of central to all. You know, pretty fantastic. Um, the opportunities that you have right there. I, I usually speak at the uh, Toronto Sportsman Show every year. And I generally start out by pointing in each direction and showing the people what phenomenal fisheries they have and telling them how how close they actually are. So, yeah, you know, Southern Ontario's got way more musky than you know close by. And if you're in Ontario, you've got access to the best musky fisheries on the planet. Yeah, definitely. Um, so some of the other chapters, we've got uh, Bell River near Windsor, near Lake St. Clair. Uh, Kitchener, Waterloo, there's us in Hamilton, uh, Mississauga, Barrie, Toronto, Kawarthas, Ottawa, Sudbury, and uh, 
Yeah, I mean, there's uh, there's a lot here, and then I, then I mentioned earlier, there's uh, Montreal and New Brunswick as well, and um, I mean, in some ways, it might be intimidating to think about just showing up at a chapter meeting, but we're all just guys that are that are interested in the fish and the fishery. Um, if if you're a little bit concerned or reluctant to show up, it's no problem to reach out to somebody and, and sort of get to know at least one person that'll be at a meeting. Most of us have a pretty strong Facebook presence. And if you struggle with that at all, I mean, feel free to reach out to me and I'll try and introduce you to somebody in another chapter so you, you at least, you know, have somebody to talk to when you show up. I know for me, I was a little bit intimidated at first, but I was really lucky that uh, I didn't really think about it too much. I just showed up, sat down and, and uh, ordered a beer and it was it was great from there. I mean, we've got uh, a whole a whole bunch of learning opportunities um, at the meetings themselves. We have a speaker every month. So typically we have guides, bait makers, researchers, and anybody who catches a lot of fish. I mean, that's what we all want to hear about, right? We want to hear about guys that go out and have success and, and hear about the story, hear about the passion, see the pictures like uh, Frank and John were talking about earlier. We have gear guys, electronic, ex excuse me, electronics experts, people who get into boat rigging. So Dave Duchak of Trojan Tackle is a member of our chapter. Um, I don't know. We also have Brent Bocek you had last week, and and Frank's Frank's with us now. So uh, so there's a lot of, of very passionate people, and I'd encourage anybody who's even considering it to reach out. And I mean, you don't need to be a member to show up or or to reach out. And uh, if you decide you like it, it'd be great if you wanted to join one of our chapters. Fantastic, um, Lisa. If there's a question that anybody has, um, you can throw it up for us now. Um, that was fantastic. It was a really good explanation on the diversity of learning available in the club. And, you know, the musky guys, especially the old guys, um, they're really willing to share and to teach because, you know, again, the, 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 the learning about the fishery, the importance of every fish, the handling, those are all, you know, the older you get, the more you realize how important those lessons are and, and what a, what a treat it is to, pass that knowledge on to a new generation so you know Caden and Caden in your chapter represents uh, a new generation of musky fishermen um you know and then there's old gray hairs too so yeah a lot of guys talk about how much more they prefer to, to help other people catch fish in their boat there's a lot of guys especially trolling you know they prefer to, to drive the boat get people on fish and then have them catch it which is pretty cool you know you know, it's funny that you say that because I, I have a lot of friends like that as well. And, and yeah, your your joy as you get older it becomes um, passing the knowledge on, seeing that, that smile on someone else's face and knowing that they're never going to forget that story and that you were just a little bit, you know, just a little, had a little something to do with it. So, yeah, something that we all absolutely love. Um, wow. Wow. I think we're uh, about right on our 90 minutes and I haven't seen a question come up lately. So uh, maybe it's a good time for us to say um, thanks, Dave. Um, okay. Really thorough, really thorough explanation of what a chapter is, um, of what you guys are doing in Southern Ontario um, and, and some great upcoming things as well. So super place to uh, leave and finish um, episode three season one of the monday night musky seminar series um we told you last week that we were going to do a draw of a hybrid lure to anybody who liked our uh, musky factory baits page who liked the ottawa river musky factory or who um liked this broadcast um this episode will go up again on the uh, on the site as soon as we're done um, you've got 20 minutes, and Lisa's going to do this draw uh, and post the results after. So any hybrid that we sell from Musky Factory Baits is yours simply for liking us, even if you don't. So thanks for coming by, everybody. Appreciate it. Send your questions. Send your feedback. Uh, send your Ask the Biologist questions. And send any send along any topics that you'd like to see us cover. Um, in the next 17 weeks, the Muskie Monday Seminar Series. I'm John Anderson. Thanks for coming out.